Hello, everyone, and welcome to day 57 of Bitwise, where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, today, we move on, as promised, to sequential logic and things having to do with stateful systems. So far, we've kind of been in the purely functional world of combinational circuits, and now we're moving on to um, so-called sequential logic, which is uh, when, combinatorial, when combinational logic is combined with stateful components like registers and memories. Um, but I do want to add a small adjoint to, uh, to dividers since we ended the last stream on sort of a sour note with a unresolved bug in our code for non-restoring division. And literally a few minutes after the stream turned off, I got it working and it was basically correct, except that I, I had switched some ones and zeros and because I wasn't thinking about it right. Uh, incidentally, the way I actually fixed it is I did what I should have done all along, which is uh, when we did the simple restoring division uh, circuits, step one for me was implementing it just as software algorithms, just to serve as a reference implementation and to double check my, uh, my thinking. But for some reason, I didn't do that for uh, non-restoring division. I just dived into the circuit sort of arrogantly and then um, which meant that I had a much harder time debugging whether something was due to the specific circuit uh, features or due to the algorithm per se um, and so yeah the first thing I did was just turn it into a, a software program and then I it actually worked and then I realized what was wrong in my circuit version and basically all it was is um, I was thinking and I, I, I must have been saying it a million times during the stream as well, that when you add something to the remainder, the digit in the quotient should be um, should be negative. I mean, it should correspond to a negative value. Um, and that was exactly opposite. When the quotient goes up, the remainder goes down, uh, and vice versa. When the uh, when the remainder goes down, the quotient goes up. And so that was literally just the bug. Uh, and then. And, and, it, and if you do that, you end up with, with this code here, and I can just prove to you that it uh, runs and passes tests, although I think right now n is too large to finish in a reasonable amount of time. So I'm just... So anyway, yeah. Um, so that works. And then I also no noticed a small optimization, which is, remember, there's this final restoring step, and indeed one way of... Um, understanding non-restoring division is that you're always lagging one iteration behind, which um, loosens up the critical path to get you some better performance. Uh, so there's this extra, there's this step here where we convert the positive and negative digits into the normal binary representation. And then there's a final restoring step. Um, it, like I said, because we're kind of lagging one iteration behind. Uh, and so I, I just noticed that um, this minus one can be absorbed into this. And um, by doing this instead, and let me just show you that this works. Then I'll show you the derivation, which is very simple. Uh, so basically, if you if you write what what this is, this is the 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 first alternative here of this when clause should be uh, q minus not q minus one, and if you write it as follows, you get this. And then if you know two's complement, you know that this is equivalent to minus q. Uh, and this in turn is just 2q, which is equivalent to left shift, uh, left shifting q by 1. So so that's how you get rid of that extra carry propagate addition. Uh, you just do like this. So um, that's where that comes from. That's a small optimization, but it's, uh, it's noticeable when you do the delay calculation. All right. Um, so enough about division and all these other combinational circuits. We will return to arithmetic circuits later when we go to... Uh, when we get to floating point somewhere in the future. Um, and um, there's a totally different approach to a division, which is often used nowadays in high performance circuits, even for integer division. Um, and w without going into it, basically, I'll say that uh, all the algorithms we looked at here are essentially based on, you know, simple number theory. They're all about uh, you know, there's always a remainder, a partial remainder that we're tracking throughout the computation, and we're trying to reduce that remainder to, you know, the minimal range between zero and the divisor. Um, and so somehow these are all natively, they're all about integers or something like that. And indeed, this algorithm here works for also for things like polynomial division with very little change. Um, so it's, it's somehow, it's a more algebraic kind of thing like that. Um, there's a totally different class of division algorithms, which are based on looking at things through the lens of 
you know, rational numbers or real numbers. And you can use those even for integer division. You just have to make sure that you never, um, that, that you, that you do an error analysis that ensures that you have enough intermediate bits of precision that when you do a fi final rounding step, uh, you will always get the correct integer result. Um, and so that's things based on Newton's method where, for example, to calculate n over d, you calculate the reciprocal of d with enough bits of precision that when you multiply it by the largest possible n, you have at most one half error in the last place. And then when you round to nearest, that means you get the correct integer result. So um, uh, and there's something called Goldsmith division, which is a similar idea um, using a uh, basically ver using a version of the geometric series to calculate um, to calculate um, I mean basically using this identity um, using this using this identity um, uh, if you know geometric series using this identity and then using an expansion of this in powers of two that gives you a logarith that gives you more more efficient representation so stuff like this basically that that isn't really looking at things through the lens of integers and number theory but is looking at it through the lens of say real numbers and stuff like that so that's a totally different class of things um i want to delay talking about that until we get to floating point numbers because they are used for floating point but they're also used for integers and that way we can kind of uh circle back a little bit to uh, to integer division at that point um, and that class incidentally for FPGAs that is probably what you would use is is that style of division algorithm because um, FPGAs have built-in fast multipliers and so one of the good things about these algorithms I just described is that they are multiplication based uh, Newton's method uh, when you write it out for the correct uh, for the correct function or Goldsmith's uh, division algorithm, they're all based on basically calculating uh, reciprocals or quotients or whatever uh, in terms of multiplications. Uh, and so those are probably what we will be using in practice, um, but I just wanted to cover sort of the short story here um, with the most basic algorithm, which is binary division, then showing the non-restoring uh, variant of it, which is a, a substantial optimization, but um, still pretty slow in the grand scheme of things especially if you have 64 bits or something like that. Um, and uh, there is an algorithm called SRT division, which is sort of a fast uh, way of accelerating this general class of division algorithms, uh, which seems to be used less nowadays, but um, was the way you did fast division back in the day. But I, I will completely sidestep that. It's pretty complicated, and it's kind of a dead end uh, in a sense in that a lot of the other cool division algorithms I mentioned are kind of part of a broader universe of numerical methods. And so I think they're worth knowing just in terms of how they fit into that um, context, whereas SRT division is, uh, while it, for all I know, it might be still important in practice, it seems like more of a specialized kind of, a little bit of a dead end in terms of, of methods, whereas things based on Newton's method are uh, point towards broader applications. So anyway, uh, enough about our arithmetic circuits. Indeed, we'll, we'll try to leave um, uh, combinational logic behind for a bit and move on to uh, stateful systems, things that um, that run on a clock that can re that have some notion of time and, and state evolving over time. Um, so like I said, so far what we've basically been doing uh, from a software perspective, you can think of as uh, deterministic parallel functional programming. Deterministic in the sense that um, uh, well, uh, functional programming in the sense that um, you know outputs are purely a, a, a mathematical function of inputs. Given the same inputs, we always get the same outputs. There's no hidden internal state that evolves or that you depend on to compute those outputs. Uh, deterministic in the sense that it's sort of deterministic uh, parallel in the sense that um, what we really care about is when we're talking about uh, performance is typically the depth of a circuit because we kind of assume that anytime there's independent branches in the in the dependency graph, those things can execute in parallel. So sort of in software terms, combinational logic corresponds to that. Um, now we're going to introduce um, some notion of, of, of sequencing, of, of, of things happening uh, after each other in a strict way that's more like software. Um, and um, I'm going to introduce that in a way that starts, uh, starts simpler than maybe the way it's often introduced in um, sort of a uh, traditional um, electrical engineering or computer engineering curriculum um, by uh, by basically thinking about stateful systems having 
Uh, in fact, I won't even make reference to a clock. The clock will be implicit. And what it really corresponds to in traditional terms is systems that have a single master clock for the whole system. Uh, and, and since there's only one clock, you can sort of suppress the clock and just think of it as sort of, uh, you know, it's just sort of part of the um, part of the context kind of implicitly there, but you don't have to think about it very hard. Um, and I think that's the right place not only to start, but it's also the right way to design most subsystems because it will turn out that even large systems on a chip that have dozens of clock domains, each clock domain will usually be quite self-contained and will have very well-defined boundaries if it's properly designed. So we will start with what in traditional terms would be called you know, a synchronous system with a single clock domain. Um, but from a software perspective, what this really corresponds to is double buffered state, essentially. So uh, previously, we've had systems that you could sort of, uh, you know, you, you can think of as, as being written like this, where you have a function f that's a, you know, it's a mathematical function, essentially, uh, get, which is given a set of inputs and uh, computes output. And here, both input and output can be, you know, can be data structures. They don't have to be single bits or bit vectors. They can be tuples, nested tuples, records, whatever. Um, and what we're going to move to now is stateful systems. And in aggregate, if you think of the system as a whole, you can think of this as being um, modifying this equation by adding state into the picture, but nevertheless still having a pure mathematical function that ties together the evolution of the state uh, as follows. Namely, you, have, uh, you still have output, but now you also have next state. Um, and uh, instead of just depending on the, the inputs, which you think of as being sort of external inputs, like um, you know things coming coming in from outside the system, um, you also depend on the current state. I'm just going to write this as state. Um, so this is essentially um, well, this is this defines a state machine. Uh, and when you think about a state machine, you can think about it on many different levels. Uh, you can think about a system as a whole as being a single state machine. Um, but more commonly, when people talk about state machines, they often focus on sort of a leaf level thing, like a, a small state machine in isolation. Uh, and you can, of course, you can compose many different state machines together into a big stateful system. But that's this is sort of the basic picture. Um, and the benefit of this formulation is that we still have this simple mathematical model where there is a mathematical function that relates um, you know, the current input and the current state to the output and the next state. Um, and then by running this function over many different cycles, we evolve the state of the system and compute what's called a trace, which you can think of as being, you know, the, the output over time and uh, with an internal state that's sort of being threaded through that uh, chaining. Um, so this is the basic idea. And um, the, basic, uh, the basic stateful component is going to be a register. Um, a register in our terminology is what would normally be called a flip-flop. It's triggered flip-flop. Um, and um, this fits pretty well into this formulation. The basic idea of a flip-flop is um, it's a stateful element. You can think of it as holding, you can think of it as holding, you know, a single bit value is, is usually the way people think about it at a fine grain, but you can also just think about it as holding, you know, a bit vector uh, or some more complex piece of state. Ultimately, it all boils down to a bunch of bits, but, um, but in any case, um, and the idea behind a register is, um, you know, much like in a uh, in a game, for example, we have a game loop where you are uh, running a simulation forward. Uh, you you compute the next state of the simulation in terms of the current state of the simulation and any external inputs, uh, and the outputs in that scenario might be something like, you know, what do you want to show to the user that that tick. Um, here we uh, we have a similar setup, and um, the idea behind flip-flops is that you think of them as uh, as basically outputting their current value so that you can s sample it and compute based on it um, until the next tick, which is, you know, I won't talk too much about it right now, but sort of in traditional uh, logic design terms, that's like there's a, a square waveform uh, that corresponds to the clock at some periodic signal. Uh, and on the rising edge, for example, of that, uh, of that clock signal, um, you evolve the state forward. So that's like an event. It's like the next tick starts there. And what happens on that edge is um, based on the input 
So, so one of so the output of the register is the current value. The input to the register specifies the next value, and on that event, which is conventionally the rising edge, um, the entire system synchronously jumps forward to the next state. So previously it was outputting um, its then current state, but then when the when the when the when the rising edge happens, it's like a tick. All the flip flops synchronously, sort of in lockstep move forward sample what what their current you know their their current inputs are that specify the next state namely this part of the output here um and they all synchronously move forward to the next state um in lockstep and and there's all kinds of things that you have to ensure for that to work reliably uh which i won't cover right now like uh, setup time and hold time and and all this other stuff ultimately th those things are why you can't run a CPU faster than you can. I mean, there's many reasons that you might be limited on that side of things, but uh, the, the most basic reason is simply that um, uh, all the all the different flip-flops must have a stable value for that input that specifies the next state before they can all move forward in unison to the uh, to the next tick. But that's the basic idea. Um, and in software terms, this is like a double buffered system where rather than mutating the state in place to produce the new state, you define the new state in terms of a copy of, uh, you know, uh, an immutable copy that corresponds to the current state of the system. And then you gradually, you define the new state. And then when the new state has been completely defined in terms of the old state, you can then flip over to the next state atomically. That's sort of the same idea. But enough babbling. Um, let me actually show you what that boils down to in the simulation. So I can kind of just give you the semantics in the simulation context, and then hopefully you'll understand behaviorally what this means. Um, so I actually already have a register node defined in the system. Um, and um, right now it doesn't have any semantics associated with it. It's really just there. Um, I, I put it in a while ago. Um, but right now it doesn't really do anything. You have to specify a type, and that means that uh, since this is a node, anytime you refer to the register node, you're really referring to its current value. That's the intent. Um, then there are these three fields. Um, there's init, which specifies the initial value. So when when the system is um, is initialized, um, you need to have a constant value for the different uh, the registers that compose the state of the system. Um, so by default, this is just whatever zero value typically. Um, uh, there is um, there is next next um, can if you leave it as as none next just uh, next equal to none basically just means retain you know the next state is equal to the current state but generally you will basically always want to uh, define next for a register and it specifies the circuit expression that basically defines um, the next state of the system when the system ticks. So for example, if you want to have a counter, um, say you want to have an 8-bit counter, you would write it like this. Um, register is just a constructor for this register node. Um, and then you would say counter.next equals, and then you need to specify a circuit expression of type bit 8, which tells, you know, tells the counter wh what value to become, uh, what value, what, what state, what value to assume the next tick, uh, and this is defined like uh, like in my previous picture with uh, you know output next state equals this. Th this can be defined not only in terms of counters current state, but indeed anything anything else in the system, including external inputs, but also the current values of other registers. So a simple counter would just be like this. The next value of counter is the current value plus one. Um, you could also have something more complex, but that's basically the setup. Um, right now, I also have an enable signal. Um, this is really not strictly required. Like you can synthesize that yourself if you want to. Um, let me just see if I'm actually using this anywhere, uh, because otherwise I will just kill it, just not to confuse to confuse you too much. Um, Yeah, let me just comment that out, and then we'll we'll leave out enable, uh, and I'll also even leave out init for now. Um, now nah, let's leave it init. I think that's it's good. To, it's good to be explicit about that, even if you can have a default value. So um, uh, 
Um, okay. So anyway, that's just kind of syntax, right? Like I, I, I told you about the intended meaning, but for now, all we have there is syntax. Um, so let's talk about how this plays out in the simulation. Um, if you recall the way, um, let me let me print out. If you don't remember exactly what what kind of code we generated in the simulation, let me just uh, let me just run this and give you some examples. So uh, here's an example of what a um, uh, of what a compiled simulation looks like. So you have, um, and, and now you'll also see why I chose to make this into an object rather than just generating a function, because so far we've only been dealing with kind of purely functional stuff, you know, combinational circuits. Um, and so it might have seemed awkward that I actually had this kind of stateful object to represent a circuit instance, and that you then had to call this class method uh, to get the sort of purely functional interface to it. Uh, but now that we're dealing with synchronous systems, sequential stateful systems, you'll probably see uh, what this was kind of anticipating. Um, so this is what we have right now. Um, you can see that the inputs and outputs of the circuit, uh, in this case, uh, N and D are the inputs. I happen to know the uh, numerator and divisor, and Q is the output. But in any case, the inputs and outputs are these stateful uh, fields of the object, um, just so they effectively are implicit registers that hold their values until they're overridden, right? Um, and that's just convenient for interacting with the outside world. Um, when we move to have registers, um, you will basically, you will just get another, you will get a, a another, um, I mean, I can even take our example here that I wrote. What was it? Um, my counter example, is it here? Uh, let me show you what this kind of thing will will turn into. Um, so uh, let me actually let me make it a little more interesting. Let's say that uh, there's also an external input. Um, so the external input is going to be enable, um, and so uh, it's going to be a single bit input. Um, and then there's also going to be an output which I call a value, and it's just going to be the value of the counter. Um, so here we have basically something of that form earlier where, um, what was it, output, next state, f input, state. We have this kind of thing here where um, the output would be the value, uh, the input would be the enable, and um, state and next state correspond to counter and uh, counter next. So let's look at what kind of um, simulation this would compile to. Um, so, You have the usual junk, um, so you have the enable signal, and it would be uh, the inputs and outputs don't have default values. And indeed, the I don't I'm not going to uh, set the uh, default values for even for registers, um, even though they do need some d real default value that's not something like none. I won't set them in the constructor. I want to handle that in an explicit separate function. Um, so anyway, enable is one input. Another, what was the output is is value. And then there's the internal register, which maybe I'll sort of space it out to signify that these are kind of internal. These are not exported, at least officially. You can obviously still reach in and look at them, but they're not part of the public interface. So this would be counter. Um, and it's just going to be a variable. Um, then I'm going to have a function called reset. Um, and in circuit terms, reset is basically, um, it's a signal that can be asserted. Uh, it's going to be implicit for now in our formulation of things. Uh, it does have to be explicit in the simulation, but it's not part of, you know, how you code things. If you want to code a circuit, you see uh, there's nothing about reset up here. It's just implicit. Um, but when the reset is asserted, you're supposed to reset the system into a well-defined state. Um, you know, typically some quiescent initial state all zeros or whatever. Some things may not be all zeros, but you can kind of think of it that way, whatever the startup uh, system state is. And in a real system, you typically have, you know, you first have power on reset. So when you actually flip the power switch, it will gradually, uh, you know, get, get put into a, a well-defined initial state so it can start running. Um, that's kind of this, the thing that reset does. So in our case, counter would just, let's say, set counter to zero. Um, and so you could even, 
I mean, maybe I don't even want to do it in the constructor, but I certainly could. Maybe I should. Um, uh, so maybe I just do it like this. So reset is responsible for doing this. I guess you could even say, um, maybe you could even make an argument that these should be set here as well. Um, but for now, let's just say that this only deals with input or, or internal state. Um, and then as before, we have an update function. And I may actually, now that I think about it, maybe I want to change that uh, name a little bit. But uh, anyway, um, so just to be true to the pattern, let's say we have this mask. Um, for every register, I'm going to synthesize um, an additional, uh, basically an inter what you might think of as an output that only really exists to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? An output that only really exists for the sake of driving the register's next value. So you can, um, I mean, maybe you can think of it as being kind of at this level. It's not really state. It's a signal. It's like an output signal. It's just that it's not exported externally. Um, but it's not It's not state. It's not something that's that holds its value from tick to tick. Just like uh, outputs don't hold their value from tick to tick. They have to be reevaluated every time. It, it happens that because we're representing these using variables, they do kind of hold their value. But that's an implementation artifact. That's not how cir the circuit actually works. Um, but anyway, then if you look at what we're doing up there, um, we want to do something like this, counter next. Um, in reality, there would be, I'm going to write it without all these intermediate T variables, um, but you can imagine that was there. Um, yeah, maybe I will. Um, Something like this. Um, maybe even like this. Um, okay. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to you can just do it like that something like this um and then value is uh, equal to self counter which is t2 something like this so um as before this is uh this recomputes all of the outputs in terms of the current inputs in this case you can think of the current state also as being kind of like an input right you can actually think of this as being there's two kinds of inputs. There's the external inputs and there's the internal inputs. The internal inputs are the values of the registers. Same with the output. There's the external outputs and there's the internal outputs, which define define the next state of the registers. Um, what you'll note about this function is it doesn't actually advance the state because it doesn't set the value of counter. It sets the value of counter next. Um, and so there's going to be a separate function, which I'll call tick. And tick is going to then actually advance the state of the system. Um, so in this case, there's only one register, and so there's only one statement here. Um, in these simple systems, this separation between update and tick will um, will not seem extremely important, um, but later on, it will it will turn out to be useful to to do the split. And in particular, um, even though this performs mutations to these internal variables like counter next and self value and whatnot. Um, it's good to have a function that's idempotent that doesn't change any sort of real state. Like I know these are state in a superficial software sense, but the only thing that's true state from a circuit perspective is counter. And by having this function that's kind of idempotent, you can call it multiple times. You can change the inputs and call it and have it update. Um, being able to do that separately from the actual tick is pretty important. Um, like for example, well, anyway, like I think that makes sense, but um, you, you know, it, to just take that for granted that this is a good split for now. But anyway, then if you want to simulate the system every tick, essentially you um, you instantiate it, uh, and then you know you can say um, you know counter update, uh, or you you can set some initial values for enable. So you can say first enable is one, uh, 
You can do counter update, um, and uh, then you can do counter tick, um, and uh, maybe you do uh, counter value, and uh, and then tick, uh, and so that's kind of one tick. And then maybe uh, either the next cycle you do the same. Uh, and I can tell you in this case, you're going to get a value of, of, of zero because that's the initial value. And even though we did the update, that's still defined in terms of uh, the current value of counter. It hasn't been ticked to update yet. So after this, um, it's only at this point when we tick that the state actually advances. This is the double buffered part um, of, of the setup. And so, uh, so this is going to be one. And if we then do it again, actually, regardless of, uh, so suppose we have zero now, uh, you're going to get two um, because we're, we're displaying the value that was updated from the previous tick. Um, but now because we set this to enable to zero, we're going to get two again. If we, even if we set enable to one, we're going to get two. Um, so that's basically how it plays out in simulation. And my hope is that kind of by showing you this, you get an idea of how it works at a circuit level as well. It's this, I haven't shown you how you would implement this in terms of transistors, but in terms of the behavior, the expected behavior, this hopefully illustrates it. Um, let me also show you why this double buffering thing is pretty important. Um, suppose you have two counters actually, um, maybe I'll make an entirely new example for this. Um, um, hmm. I mean, I guess I can do this. This is a very artificial example, um, but Something like this. Um, I just want to emphasize that. So here we have a case where we have two registers and their updates are kind of cross coupled. Uh, and what I want to emphasize is that there's basically no way to evaluate this without to get and get the correct final result without double buffering. Basically, well, in this case, you only have to double buffer one of the values if you sort it correctly. But the point is that. Um, much like when you're doing a swap, actually a swap would be another example of this. If you wanted to have a, a, a two registers that swap their value every tick if enable uh, is set, this is just like the classic case of trying to swap two variables in place. You know, you can't do it without an intermediary unless you use the XOR trick or something like that. But the point is the double buffering avoids the sort of issues you get here where there is no, there's no cyclic ordering of these updates where you can do them in place. You need at least some temporary values to store the values you're overwriting so they can be used later on and so on. Um, so that's kind of the motivation for why this general kind of synchronous update when you have many different pieces of state that can be cross coupled in this way, uh, you really need to do a double buffer. There's no way to sort things so you can do everything in place. You need to copy at least some of it. And you can, in fact, you can set it up in such a way that uh, everything except one thing has to be copied if you set it up for the worst case. So this double buffering approach um, is is really essential when you have this kind of setup. All right. Um, so let's actually go and implement this. Um, so here we here we did it by hand. This gave us sort of a template. So what do we need? We need to um, for every register we need to generate um, um, some reset code. We need to generate a corresponding internal signal, which is then set um, like this. And then we need to have a tick function, which um, which actually uh, latches the new the new state. So um, Let's see here. Oh, I think I forgot to actually post. So, so let me just tweet out the uh, the stream thing. I actually forgot to post it on Twitter for some reason. All right, 
so let's see what what this whole thing entails um i think one thing i'm going to do is i'm going to um i think i'm going to make these um make these variables be um private just so i can have a type checking property accessor so um i'm going to have uh, something called next which returns the value of this and then i'm going to have uh what is it next setter i think it is um where you can set it and um i guess i'll just call this node i'm going to use my do my normal uh, conversion and then i'm going to um i'm going to check the type basically so that um What's the usual? Well, actually, I have, now that I think about it, I have functions to do this. Check, uh, check type. What's that called? Um, oh, right. I think you can just do self type. Um, and then you only set this if, uh, if it passes that check. Um, I think that works. So let's, let's just check. That's very basic, obviously. But let, let me just check that those type checks are uh, correct. Um, and for that, I can actually just instantiate a register free form here. Um, okay, to get rid of that debug print code, although we might need it in a minute. Um, if I now set this to actually for register next, uh, one thing you can do here is you can uh, you can use self type as the uh, context type for so if you have a literal it will be converted to the expected type. Same kind of thing we do all over the place in the Iron compiler with expected types for literals. Um, so I should be able to do this. Um, can't set attribute. All right. Um, let me just quickly remind myself of how that stuff works. Oh, right, it has to be the same name, right, because it overrides it with, uh, with the decorator. Okay, so that works. Um, but now if I do something crazy like this, Oh, interesting. Well, that's not really the expected error, but um, because it's, it's trying to do the as node, I'll, I'll look at that later. But um, if I do, for example, if I take like a bit, a bit, I don't know, a bit, uh, too wide bit vector, right? I get um, a type error. So that's as expected. Um, all right. <clears throat> so. Uh, that looks good. You know what? Even for this, I should be using the accessor because that way we get implicit. We just reuse this code for uh, we we get you know initialization type checks as well. The same through the same code path. All right. Um, uh, okie dokie. So then, um, let's look at, um, and in fact, let me just, uh, just so we have a running example, let me put in that counter, uh, the counter example we were, we were using there. So, um, 
So we have a register. And when the enable is set, it counts forward. Otherwise, it retains its value. And then this is going to just output that thing. Oops, I believe that's example 38. And we have to do this. All right, so what is it saying here? Oh, right, because it's none. Um, I guess we'll just do it like this. So you're setting it to none is basically like disconnecting that port, uh, meaning, yeah. All right. Um, so that works. Let me just verify that it. Uh, let me pull that further up. just make sure we can visualize it just so that as we're debugging stuff or looking at it uh, we have a way to look at it uh, visually as well uh, do i have doesn't look like it Right, so this is what it looks like. Um, you can see there's a loop, which is characteristic of these stateful systems because of their next state is defined in terms of their current state. So you can see the next state, uh, which is whatever feeds into this port, is defined in terms of the current state um, via this multiplexer. And there's the plus one, let's see. You can choose between the current value and the current value plus one, depending on the value of enable. So anyway, that looks good. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's then look at the simulation side. Um, I think if you linearize it, I can't remember if I defined linearization for, um, yeah, so we have to figure out what to do for registers here. Um, I think we have to do something a little bit beyond the normal, a little bit beyond the norm when it comes to this. So on the one hand, sure, we need to have basically like a register instruction, which which in this case, just like we have something called input and output, these just means read the value of that thing. Um, and so I think all we have to do here is um, what do we do? Um, I think we have to do basically like make register. We have we, we need some way of collecting all the registers that are part of the system. Um, and so um, we can just abuse the same counter. Um, but yeah, let's make a name, which is like R whatever. Um, and um, I guess we need to know the type. So let me let me think, what do we need to know about it? Um, I guess we need to know everything basically. So um, if you make a register, what do you have to know? You have to know, um, You have to know what's connected to this thing. Um, which could be nothing. 
Is that it? The type of static uh, in it is important as well. Um, I guess we can just like um, like we need a name, um, we need a type. Um, Maybe the, maybe we don't have to commit to a type at this point, uh, or a name rather. No, I think we want to. Okay, so this is, that's that stuff is fine. Um, let's write this a little bit differently. Self node next. If node next is not none, else none. Um, type next init. We can pass through init directly because that's um, let's see here. So we make this thing, we, we recursively visit next in order to determine what temporary that drives. And then we put that in this big registers list. And um, all right, I think that is it. Um, then we have to do self make register node. Uh, when we do this make temp, I want to actually, normally we want to detect cycles, but for registers specifically, we want to allow cycles. So I want to actually, um, what is that called for pass? It's just called set. Okay. Um, so normally you, re you just return temp, but in this case, I'm going to set that up like this so you can refer to it um, and so after this we can call this which might incur a recursion uh, okay then at this point we need um, at this point we need we need to specify the register uh, I mean, I guess we can just make it like a tuple. No, so, okay, what we're gonna do is we're going to index it under the name, and then we associate it with the tuple from there. And then we return the name so you can reference it, and you can go and look it up in the dictionary. I think that's it. We need to know the type, the initial value, and the next thing. Okay. Um, okay, make register. Um, so no type. I guess we can just actually do it in line like this. Um, okay, so let's just try linearizing it on its own. Um, seeing if we run into any issues. Unhandled default case, that's for a node of type register node. Um, Oh, so that's for the inliner. Right, because we have to inline everything. I think that's fine. Um, we just, what is it? Copier, is that what it's called? Transformer. Uh, 
I think we actually don't need to do anything special. We just need to do the usual um, recreation. Um, so register node, we, pu we push in the type and the init value, but, but not the next value because of there can be cycles. Um, and then you have to set next to node.next and return new node. All right, what was the typo? Right, this should be a member variable. All right, let's look at it. Um, okay, so T0 is a bit and we read it from there. Um, T6. Is a constant equal to one? T5 is T2. So T2 has not been computed, so that means there is a bug there. Um, T2 comes later in the list. That's interesting. Let me think about that. I think I see why that is. Um, The register, where is it? This thing here depends on R3. So we can actually do that. This is where putting this in separate functions actually makes it harder to do the right order. Let's just stick it right in. So um, basically what it boils down to is we actually want to emit this before we recurse on the next and we can do that. Um, I guess. Just have to make sure that we insert an instruction with this name before we recursively visit. Uh, the thing that defines the next value. Let me just read through this. Um, and I think in this case, we don't actually need to do the cyclic check because we. No, I guess we do because this thing will generally recurse back and depend on it. We just need to make sure that before this happens, this thing has been emitted. Uh, and then having done that, we add this register under the name with the type and so on. Okay. Right, so now we compute the value of the current value of the register, we sample that into a temp, and then only afterwards do we read it. Here we add t2 to that. Similarly, here. Okay, that's fine. Um, and then the way we're still not. There's still. <clears throat> there's no. There's no instruction here for setting the next 
state um, per se. So let me just think about Like, I guess that's basically what's in here. Um, I guess I, if I want to do it for now, I can do do this. Um, okay. So now we have registers. Um, and They say what the next values are. So there's no init value, which means default to whatever the default is for that type, which is zero, uh, and T4 is where this thing is. So now, if you look at um, at this code here, um, most things are the same. Like for example. Uh, for reading from registers, I think really um, there's just a name, just as with inputs. Um, something like this. So that's enough to basically handle this part of it. Um, but then there's also, after all of these, let's see. Um, so let's see, for name, uh, for type, init next in registers um, you have to basically something like this um, sorry it should be dictionary so we um, something like this of course we have to also create those variables I think that's it for that um, Old, an, old, an old code should still compile, so that's good. Um, all right, let's try compiling. This is probably not going to work because there's going to be errors. Um, interesting. Let's temporarily print the code again. Oh, it's not the right example. Oh, right, it should be uh, name next. But there's still going to be errors when you actually evaluate it, I guess. Um, so let's see. Self.r3, right, so we have to define r3, and we have to define r3 next, and then we have to define the tick method. But everything else looks decent. Um, okay. Should also be template, right? Um, so we have to expand this template. 
Um, so there's going to be tick. There's going to be reset. Um, okay. Right, so there's there's reset. So there's going to be some stuff here. And there's going to be um, it's going to be some stuff here. Let me think about what that stuff is. I guess um, it's pretty similar to this. Um, something like that. And then for tick, it's going to be um, something along those lines. Um, right. Um, well, actually, I guess let's maybe pull this out. It's getting a little crowded. So we get stub methods if it's a combinational circuit, which is what we want. But then for our counter circuit, um, And that looks reasonable. Um, yeah, at least that should be 
with with this it should be possible to test something so example 38 um This is going to be a little bit different, I suppose. Um, you have to, well, let's say we do 10 techs. In every tech, um, you provide um, let's say depending on whether depending on whether this is even or odd, we uh, enable uh, and then after every update, uh, we print the um, the value, and then we take the circuit. Uh, update missing. Okay, so I guess it's some of this code here. Update missing. Reset tick. Oh, right. So this is just the compiled thing. Um, you have to actually, here we were just using it as a class method. Um, You have to actually instantiate it. It's actually a class. Because now it has state. Um, To reset it. Some of this stuff can be, I guess, automated, but let's just be very explicit the first time. Okay. I guess you can do. Um, So you can see it pretty much does what you expect. Initially, i is zero. So in the first tick, in the first tick, it's always going to be whatever the reset value is, regardless of enable. In the next tick, if enable had been one, it would have incremented. And so um, here you can see expected results. Hopefully, hopefully expected for you. But, but anyway, this is what you should be getting. Um, you can um, you can clean up some of this interface. Uh, so one one thing that's convenient, and the, I, I will sh I will show. I'm not sure how much I'll be able to do today. I'll show a bunch of of tricks for making it convenient to interact with um, with um, circuits like this, in particular things that are more like a coroutine. Um, and there's two styles that are useful. One of them is when your test harness itself is um, sort of the master, and it's basically treating the circuit as a an iterable. So you can treat it as an iterable, where every time you, every time it yields, it ticks forward, and it yields the current set of uh, outputs at every point. Um, so that's one useful uh, model. The other useful model is um, more like a symmetric coroutine, where Maybe you actually have multiple things. You're not the only thing. There's maybe multiple modules as part of your test that act as concurrent agents. And in that case, um, you have a scheduler that sort of gets everyone a chance to run. And when everyone has run, it advances the system. And you can say, wait for 10 ticks or wait for some condition or something like that. Um, but let's start by uh, wrapping this up in, in something that's like an iterable. And so basically, what I want to be able to do is uh, when I've made an instance like this, <clears throat> I want to be able to say for output in instance, um, um, 
basically the same kind of stuff. Um, but then between uh, between each of these, you can do the same sort of thing you were doing before. Um, but you don't have to do updates and ticks and stuff. Um, incidentally, one reason this uh, style is uh, is not ideal necessarily, uh, or is, might, might have some confusions, is because of this uh, division between update and tick. If you're dealing with a combinational circuit, you want to set your inputs, then update, then read the outputs before you tick. Um, in this case, it's not clear where you would do that. You either have to set the outputs for the next tick before you actually tick. Um, so you sort of either have to do it sort of from the outside here to initialize it or just be okay with always being being behind by one, I guess. But anyway, uh, let's try... Um, I guess for now we'll have explicit resets in both cases. Um, and so note, by the way, I'm, I'm creating a new instance. That's intentional. Each of these is an independent iteration. Uh, I'm, I'm reusing the names, which is maybe a little bit dangerous, but um, whatever. So in, in order to support this style, we're basically going to, um, well, let's see. It would be something like we have our usual code, and then there would be an iter function. And the iter function essentially just, let's see, every time you ask for something, it yields the set of outputs. Um, we already have basically that. And if you look at what evaluate does, evaluate has a bundle. Um, it creates a bundle from the outputs of the circuit. So you basically want the same sort of thing. Um, let's see. An infinite loop uh, where you yield, you yield the outputs. Um, basically like this. You always update before yielding because otherwise self-value is not necessarily up to date. And then after returning, you tick and so on. So um, that is one thing that's convenient to do. And actually, I think what we're gonna do is maybe some of this stuff could just be part of a super class. We don't necessarily have to generate the code for every instance. So um, I think what I'm going to do is right now, if you look at, what is it, evaluate outputs, um, I think I'm actually going to define a function called outputs, which is just this. Just returns the current set of outputs, doesn't force an update or anything. Um, and then you can just, for the current case, you can do this. Um, and then we can also re reuse this outputs function for other purposes, like um, um, simulated, I don't know. Let's call this simulator instance. For now, let's just make it a dump class. All right, let's just get rid of this for now. <clears throat> and then um, we will make this iterable. We will say update yield outputs, then tick, something like that. Um, let's make sure that still works. Okay. Uh, unsupported, blah, 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 blah. I wonder what's going on there. 
right, so we're calling so it's complaining about this. But um, this should be an instance like any other. Let me just make sure that there's no weird interference going on. Have we not reset the circuit? Is that the issue? Instantiate it, reset it. Um, I guess the problem is the first time through, we haven't really allowed our code to run. Um, yeah, that's the problem. I mean, I guess we can just do it like this, but that kind of means we're always run out one out of date. Um, can enumerate these. Maybe what you do is the first iteration you don't get any outputs. I don't know if that's. Let me think about it. It's just an awkward structure because we need to do something both before and after. So for the first iteration, it's a little bit awkward. Hmm. So the stuff... Um... Before this can execute, they must have yielded their first thing. I don't want the right way to do that. Um, Well, I guess we can just do it like this. But it does mean that this is always based on, this is like the next set of enables that will take effect. Because when we come back from this yield, then we tech, and then the update for the next state takes place. I guess that's okay. Okay. That was maybe too many iterations. Um, what we want to do before this thing goes crazy, uh, you can sip the range 10. And we have the same kind of pattern before, except the first iteration. Let me think. The first iteration is before the first tick. Think about that. And I guess you can, if you want it to be equivalent, I guess you can just do this. Um, but yeah, this is a little bit awkward. I'll have to think about the best way to expose this iterator interface. It's possible it's not as clean as I anticipated. Um, but anyway, you can do this sort of thing. But, but, but let me just say one of the, aside from just 
being an interface that hides some of the stuff about updating and ticking and whatnot. Another reason this is a good abstraction is that it, it represents a circuit uh, via its trace, which is the set of outputs over time. Um, and this kind of fits it into the greater, grander scheme of like signal, uh, you know, signal processing, where you look at a signal as a set of values over time. Uh, this is discrete signal processing because time is discrete. There's discrete ticks, um, and so it fits pretty well into that. Um, let me show an example. If I if I did if I just did something like this, um, you know, you would just sample essentially the signal over time. It's just an incrementing counter. Uh, it's eventually going to wrap around. If we do 100 iterations, it's going to wrap around at, say, 16. Um, but yeah. Okay. Um, how long have I been going? Let me just check my timer. I've been going an hour and a half. Maybe I'll do something more interesting than just a counter, and then we'll call it a day. Uh, this is basically... Um, let's see, maybe I'll always reset on creation. Um, and I will I think I'm also going to start setting these to zeros so you so that they're actually defined as valid values like they have default values for the signals um, so zero is just kind of a default value even for those signals I think that's reasonable um, okay Say twenty, just so we can see some wrap around. All right. So that's the basic idea behind synchronous systems and circuits. Um, Again, one clock domain, the clock is implicit, reset is implicit at creation time. Um, usually the reset signal is actually in band in the sense that the circuit itself can assert it, right? Like, so if you think of a computer that does soft reboot or soft reset or something like that, um, so you can actually invoke the reset behavior by asserting a signal. For now, we're just going to have that be a kind of out of band uh, behavior which you cannot invoke internally, but um, easy enough to add that later. Um, but for now, it's, it's beneficial to hide those signals um, because it simplifies the abstraction. And so there's a notion of the beginning of time where things get reset. And it gets sort of reset just as a matter of a protocol rather than uh, because of explicit logic. All right. Um, so, okay, I think that's it as far as simulation goes. Hopefully, the semantics are now pretty clear as well. Um, let me think of some interesting circuits we can write, um, like state machines. So a counter is just about the simplest state machine you can write. Well, that's not true at all, um, <laughs> but uh, it's an easy thing to write. Also, 
quite useful. Counters are often useful. Um, if you have to wait for something, you can start counting, and then when it reaches a certain threshold, you take a next action. Um, but um, let's try to do something uh, that builds on previous stuff we did um, by doing a bit serial multiplier. I think that would be a good example. So we've done multipliers before. I, I, I promised we would be done with that stuff, but I think this is actually a good way of building on stuff you've seen earlier and also something that in some cases is pretty pretty realistic example, I suppose. So um, previously, the way, if you look at our na naive multipliers, um, the basic idea was to just generate one giant circuit that computes all the different things in sort of one circuit. Um, but one of the benefits of um, of sequential circuits uh, that now have state is that you can you can trade time for space. You can reuse the same smaller circuit, but but over multiple cycles to compute a result. Um, and so I'll show you. Uh, I think is the final example for today how to write a bit serial multiplier, um, which is basically a um, a state machine that computes a um, using an adder and a shifter, basically a shift register and an adder computes um, an n bit product in n cycles. So in each cycle, it will it will compute another partial. It will add in another partial product, basically. Um, and so let's um, um, let me sketch out what the logic for that's going to look like if I don't screw it up completely. Um, the idea is the following. We're going to be have we're going to have one register X, if you recall X and Y are just operands. Every cycle one X will shift uh, right by one and Y will shift um, I'll display these equations and we'll put the other stuff around it. Every cycle X will shift to the right by one and y will shift to the left, and um, and then we will have an accumulator, which is the product, and it's going to basically be um, the old p plus y masked with x zero. So the lowest bit of x, um, the lowest bit of x um, ended with y, so that's a partial product. And in every cycle, we you can think of this as multiplying y by 2 and shifting x over, so that after n iterations, we will have considered all of x's bits. We always sample the lowest bit of x, but because we're shifting over over n cycles, we will consider all of those bits, and y gets multiplied. Um, this just corresponds to how you know, um, each of these bits of x actually has a power of 2 weight, and so when they're multiplied, it's not just a bitwise and, there's also the shift to take into account. So we're just doing that. Um, so this basic circuit here is, I think, is enough to actually do that. Um, um, the big thing is it will take in cycles um, to, um, to compute its result. Let me um, first do a very naked version of this that more or less look exactly like this and then let me add some additional control signals around it that make it more convenient to interact with but for now let's just put this in and um, see if we can get that working Um, the important point to note here is that these are registers. So previously, there's I, I should probably call them something else because I, but just for consistency with our earlier examples, let's say we still have some combinational signals. We somehow have to get data inside the state machine to begin with. Um, and then eventually we're going to have an output as well. Um, what did we call the outputs for those multipliers? That was P. So um, so this is somehow going to be something in the end. Um, maybe I'll just call these reg. Um, um, this thing here actually cannot work as written. You have to replicate this bit up to uh, all the other bits of y reg, and I may have to parenthesize this because Python has weird precedents. 
Um, this is just because x reg sub one zero is a single bit, uh, and we have to make it into a bit vector, so we have to replicate that across all the different bits of y reg. Um, so this is the basic iteration, but we also need a way to um, to get data in. And we can't get data in every cycle, right? Because it has to operate basically in two modes. It's either advancing the computation or it's latching in new input. So we're also going to have an enable signal, which when you assert it, will latch in new uh, data. And so, um, or we can call it start or something like that. Um, but let's call it enable. So when enable, we latch in the external input um, and we also have to reset this because this is an accumulator. So we want this to start out as zero and then subsequently um, accumulate stuff. Does that make sense? Um, and then we can actually just output pReg directly, but we have to be careful in interpreting this because the result won't be correct until after however many cycles. And actually, if then after that number of cycles, it will then keep doing stuff. Actually, I guess at that point, these will be fully outshifted, so it'll just stabilize. Um, so anyway, let's see what let's see what happens if we do this. Um, this is quite a bit more complicated than our counter, so there's definitely potential for um, for various bugs. Um, I guess we can quickly make sure it can be turned into a diagram. All right, I'm not going to fine read that, but it looks reasonable. Um, so let's take example 39. Um, So we create this instance, and um, actually, let's just make sure we can even get this far before I start pouring on the code. Um, OK, looks sort of reasonable. Um, OK, and so what we then want to do is, in the first cycle, um, we are going to, I mean, I don't know what, what's a good 10 times 3 or something like that. Let's, let's say that's what we want to compute. Um, I don't know, 10 times 7. So we have to set those inputs, and then we set enable to 1 to signal, hey, um, accept these inputs. Um, and then you have to uh, update and ticket. Um, and one thing you want to do is you then want to set the enable back to zero, because as long as enable is set to, to one, it will basically keep starting a new job. Um, so you want to, it is called a strobe. A strobe is a signal that you want to temporarily assert high and then put it back to zero. So it's sort of like you, you set it high for one cycle. That means, hey, there's new work to do, and it will reset those internal registers to start working on that. And then you set it low again, and then it will proceed with the computation. But if you keep it high, you're essentially just going to force it to reset and start a new job every cycle without ever making progress. Um, and maybe we can actually... Uh, we, we should be able to actually look at the progress along the way because it, it's, we can constantly see the register, uh, the, the product register. So um, should just be able to do this. So initially, uh, I guess, um, I guess we'll need that many cycles. Um, I'm just going to say in cycle one, um, we'll submit the job. Uh, 
Um, but otherwise, incidentally, this kind of code is why it's useful to put the test code itself in a coroutine, uh, like a generator, because then you can just use, you can set these signal, and then you can yield, and then you can do some other stuff and yield. And so it's an easy way of sequencing stuff. But here I'm just going to use I to sort of figure out what we should do in different states. Um, and we'll just always set this to zero. We don't. We only have to set it once, but uh, let's just sort of set it to zero. We don't have to worry about these inputs because these inputs are only latched from when enable is high. So um, that should be fine. And then we do this, and we see what happens. Okay, that looks totally wrong. Um, well, actually, I don't even know if what I'm saying is true. Um, what, what were we multiplying? 10 and 7? 10 times 7 modulo 16 is 6. Okay, so 6 is actually correct, but I wonder then why it's at 14 for the temporary result one two three if i set it to like 100 i would expect it to stabilize okay so it does stabilize a six what if i do something else like three times nine I mean, I'm assuming that's correct. What was that? Uh, 3 times 9. 27 mod 16 is 11. So yeah, um, I think the correct result is, let's see, maybe n plus 2 because in the first cycle you submit it and then it, you have to work on it um, n cycles and then you have, but then it, you don't get, get to see it until the cycle after that. So I think n over 2. Um, but it, it may stop changing earlier in some cases. But yeah. Um, so uh, if you actually wanted to test this, you could do, and you can use the same instance because you can reset it or you can, you know, reassert uh, whatever. So um, you can say wine uints. We just do our brute force test case as before. Um, and then. Um, like this, and then instead of printing it, we're just going to assert that the final value is equal to x times y uh, modulo, uh, modulo n. Let's see if that's true. One times four. is 4. Mm -hmm. X Oh, it's not modulo n. It's uh, I should be doing mask. Okay, this is a more substantial. So x times y, this should just be 8 itself. Um, and apparently p is 8 as well, so why is it complaining?
why in the hell is it saying that's like even here it's saying it's true What is going on? That is very strange. That really makes no sense. I wonder if it's... Um, been using PyPy. Maybe it's a PyPy bug? Which would be terrifying, but let's uh can you comment stuff? Um Restarting. Anyway, I, I'm. It looks like the code works. It's just being funky for no apparent reason. Oh, oh there's flies flying around. Windows 10 has gotten into weird... The, the reason I have to minimize is Windows 10 has gotten into this weird mode where uh, it won't auto-hide the, uh, the bottom bar. This is so bizarre. If I do this for every instance, does it behave differently? I mean, it really shouldn't. Yeah, that's the same shit. Well, actually, let's try something here. Let's If we just print these next to each other, we should be able to see. Some of these are definitely not the same. Right, so in one case it says it's this, and then when I look at it now, It's suddenly uh, starting to be crazy. 
it's saying it's eight now. So it's like it wasn't set to the right value before. I wonder if it's something weird to do. I think I know what it is. Uh, I mean, I, I think I know why the it's inconsistent. It's being awkward. It's because the iterator cleans itself up or something like that. Um, Okay, so I think it has to do with the fact that when when the assert triggered, this tick hadn't executed, uh, and then somehow it cleaned up. I don't know, but anyway, so I think I was just off by one iteration. Okay, let's remove this code. Pretty shit. All right. Um, anyways. Um, so you can see this is doing the same test we were doing before, but now using a so-called bit serial multiplier that handles um, kind of one partial product per iteration. So this circuit is drastically smaller. It's really just uh, some shift two shift registers and um, and an adder. Like there's not much else to it. Um, so this is a drastically smaller circuit um, that trades space for time, right? Like much smaller, but um, takes several cycles now. So if you want to do a 32-bit product, it would take 32 cycles to do this. Um, let me do a version of this that is, um, that like I said, has more kind of control signals so that you don't have to sort of know how many cycles to wait and stuff like that. So um, I'm going to add, um, I'm going to add a signal called p valid, and um, the idea here is um, p valid is going to be false when um, when you're not supposed to look at p, right? So during all those sort of iterations where it's just computing p, p valid is going to be false. But then once it's done, it will set p valid to true, um, and then when you it, and it will stay true until you re-enable, basically. Uh, then once you re-enable, p-valid will be false again. So um, I'm going to create a register to correspond to this. It's going to be a single-bit register. And uh, the initial value is going to be, um, well, when you reset it, it becomes false. Otherwise, um, well, I guess there's different ways you could do it. One way to do it would be to say um, you could have an iteration counter, or which is probably better. Um, but let's do something that doesn't require yet another counter or yet another piece of state. You can just check when, uh, since throughout all of this, we're always um, ending by uh, by x. As soon as uh, x becomes all zeros, um, we can basically stop. Because at that point, uh, every subsequent iteration um, in fact, you, you can even do it like this. You can say x reg next. As soon as the next iteration uh, would be zero, um, you know that the the we're done with the partial the the partial product accumulator is not going to change anymore. This is the this may not be the best way to do this, but um, like you you could have a smaller comparator. So this is going to be say a 32-bit comparator. In this case, only four bits because then it's a test value is just four. But if this was a 32-bit thing, then this would be a 32-bit uh, and reduction tree or whatever nor reduction tree. Um, so just keep that in mind. But this is probably this should probably work, I think. Um, but anyway, then if we have this, uh, we can go and change our code, and we can basically just say. Um, well, we don't have to sort of hard code an iteration count 
we're, we're simply going to say, um, if, if we ever get to the point where um, P is valid, then we break and we break out of the loop. Um, and so in fact, we can even do like this. We can stick this outside of the loop and then inside the loop, I'm just going to put this code here. So always set this as the initial values to start the thing pumping. Um, and then when we're waiting, we keep enable uh, deasserted so we don't submit a new job and we wait for p valid to be asserted, something like this. And this may not work in the first try, but let's see. All right. Um, x is one, y is one. And uh, can't spell all of a sudden. So it says this is zero. Um, it says p valid is one. What's the iteration count? Okay. It's one before we've even started. So it's actually one from a leftover. Um, Let's move it back to what we had uh, so we can be more explicit about that stuff. So we don't look at it in the first iteration, only in the subsequent iterations, something like this. <clears throat> okay, I is one. I mean, it should never be possible to finish that quickly. So that's definitely a, a bug. So in the when i equals zero, we submit the new result. Um, in the subsequent iteration, I'm just going to see what I did. Um, P valid reg starts out as invalid. And then in subsequent iterations, if x reg, I don't think that's it, but let's just make sure that's not a bug related to that. So it always finishes in the first iteration. When it's enabled, it gets set down. P is valid as soon as, and then from there on, it's valid as soon as X reg is zero. Let me look at the state here. Um, must be something silly. Let's look at the outputs. Um, for now, let's just, I don't know, have a generous number of iterations so we know it will eventually terminate, but then just, let's just see what the problem is there. Um, Instance dot outputs. 
bound method. All right. Um. I see, so that's the problem. <clears throat> In cycle one, let me just go and look at. I need to tighten up What's it, simulator instance. When you. So in iteration one, you set some values and then. Um, I think it's mostly just the awkward iterator interface. I should really do something that's more like symmetric coroutines, but let's um, try this for now. All right, the problem here is we're not setting this back to zero. Okay. Okay, that works. And now we should be able to just use an unbounded enumeration. Right. Um, without this, we get that problem because it lacks by one, right? OK, so writing these tests will be easier once I do the coroutine interface. Basically, then you'll be able to write something like, um, You know, you would be able to write something like inputs x equals x, inputs y equals y, uh, inputs enable equals 1, uh, yield, um, while uh, outputs p valid, uh, yield assert outputs p equals y times y, something like that. Uh, I don't... Anyway, this is the kind of thing you want to be able to write, um, where the yield is essentially like yielding to a scheduler. And you can use async in a way, I guess, if you want to do it in a more modern Python style. But you, you want to be able to get to this point <clears throat> where essentially your test routine is not driving the iteration, but it's just sort of a symmetric participant. Uh, one benefit of that style, aside from just being nicer, so you don't have to do all these sort of I equals whatever kinds of things to distinguish the start of something versus the middle of something versus the end of something, is that uh, you can write multiple concurrent things that module different concurrent agents. Um, anyway. Um, I think this would work because you say this, then you do the yield, and as a result, that will update the outputs and tick. 
And at that point, it should be. Actually, let me just write a simple coroutine scheduler that works for this style. Um, This is just some ad hoc code, but uh, let's just try this. Okay. Something like this. Reset the sim, instantiate the tester using the simulation state. Um, I guess no, that's not. I want to do next. That's what I meant to do. Um, okay. So I guess let's keep the current test and write another one in parallel that's using the cleaner style. Um, and so I'll write this as example 39 test. And I will um, pass in the simulation. Uh, just call it sim. And so I'll say sim x for uh, x and units, for y and units. Sim inputs is x, or sorry, is x, y. Uh, sim enable is 1, yield. Sim enable is 0. Um, And then uh, while not sim p valid yield, um, and then assert sim p equals this. And then simulate test example. <clears throat> I guess you can just pass example 39 directly and it will instantiate it. Let's see if that works. Okay. Let's 
So yeah, that's that's closer to what I wanted to end up with. Um, I'm just gonna remove this. Well, or maybe not. But anyway, um, so you can sort of see the style here is right now we only have one thing running concurrently aside from the simulation instance, but um, you can see this is a cleaner style. So set the inputs, yield, set the input, yield, wait until the condition, yielding until the condition becomes true. And so, you know, it, you, at this point, if you want to be very explicit, you could say this, but that's <clears throat> that's the first condition of this. If it's if it's not clear, so that is the idea, um, and you can see this is much this kind of valid interface where the module itself, the state machine itself, tells you when the result is ready, is infinitely nicer to deal with as a consumer of of results than having to maintain your own sort of model of its state like having my own counter and trying to keep track of where that counter is and that's even for us who are writing the the, the software itself we're writing here is, is, is or sorry the, the test we're writing is in software but now imagine that you have another state machine that wants to consume the result from the first state machine uh it's even nicer to have this style of signaling so that everyone doesn't need to be coupled to the internals of you know how long uh, a given thing takes to compute so this, this style is sometimes called la latency What's it like latency, oblivious signaling or something like I don't know. Um, but, but but anyway, if you use the style, you can plug together modules, and they don't have to be coupled to how long each of them take to compute the result. You just kind of tell the next guy in line, "Hey, the result is ready. Here it is." That sort of thing. All right, I think that really is what I wanted to cover today. Um, I think we are done with that, and that's about two hours. Two hours and change. So yeah, hopefully um, uh, this was a nice uh, a nice change from some of the other stuff, despite the fact that we do have a multiplier showing up in one of our examples. But yeah, moving to sequential systems, so synchronous systems, um, which in traditional parlance would be like a single clock domain synchronous system. Um, we will be in this uh, in this realm for quite a bit. Um, in the coming episodes, I will talk more about. Um, state machines, how to design them coming from a software perspective, uh, and especially how to compose them. Um, I was kind of alluding to it a little bit here with these enable and valid signals. Um, if you design your interfaces correctly, it becomes much easier to build state machines and then be able to plug them together so that they can cooperate with a minimum of ceremony and uh, error prone sort of fiddling. And uh, that's kind of where we're going to be going with this. So starting with sort of building state machines and then building bigger systems by composing stage machines. Um, and then I'll be talking about pipelining as well. <clears throat> Both the easy combinational style and pipelining where you're really just taking combinational circuit and you're adding certain register slices that decouple the timing so you can meet your higher clock rates and have higher throughputs and stuff like that. Um, but also uh, eventually we'll talk about instruction pipelining once we get to CPUs, which is a, I guess what most software people would understand by the word pipelining, which is actually a, a much more complicated case because that is where you have a sequential semantics, like for a CPU instructions are required to execute as if sequential, uh, but you have to emulate that with a pipeline system. And that's where the uh, so-called pipeline hazards come into play and you have to be very, very careful. And, and the mental model becomes a lot more complex, but uh, long before we get there, there will be other much easier uh, things to, uh, to apply pipelining to. So anyway, that's it for today. Um, expect more on this general topic in the coming days and weeks. Um, but that's it for me today and I will see you next time.